Good morning, NCC students. Welcome to chapel. My name is Alonzo Lopez, and I am one of the leaders of our student-led organization called One Body. Some of you may be wondering what exactly what One Body is. Uh, well, we are a student-led organization uh, that is focusing on diversity, unity, and ministry. And we hold these things as our key themes, as our values. Um, we exist to celebrate diversity um, by recognizing different cultures, and honoring every person as an image bearer of God. We try to develop unity uh, by recognizing that in Christ, we are one body filled with the same spirit. Um, and we mobilize people for ministry by deploying students to extend the body of Christ to all nations locally and globally. So with that, this is officially One Body Week. You guys may have noticed the different decorations um, and posters throughout the campus. Um, and we, this is where we get to share those three uh, key themes with you guys throughout the week um, with various events uh, we have every night. So last night we had an awesome dodgeball tournament at Calvary. Um, and so tonight we are having a unity worship night in the Met Cafe at 7 o'clock p.m. And, and we definitely want all of you guys to attend. Um, following that, Thursday night we are having a holy chalk night. Um, and that's going to be at 6 o'clock outside. Um, and that's where we get to draw uh, different art um, on the sidewalks and douse each other with colored powder. Um, and so be sure to wear white. Um, on Friday, we get to wrap up the week with a together bonfire at 7 o'clock outside at the fire pits. Um, and so we definitely want you guys to be with that. So for part of One Body Week, we get the awesome privilege to have some special guests with us today um, to have a discussion panel, as you can see, on racial reconciliation. If you notice underneath your guys' chairs or on top of your guys' chairs, um, there are note cards for you guys to write down questions you have during the discussion. Um, hold them up, and Coach Willie and Coach Jenna and Coach Jeremy uh, will pick them up and go over them. And at the, or during, uh, so if you guys have your card, put them up, and then Coach Jeremy, Coach Jenna will pick them up, and then we'll go ahead and interrupt our discussion to go ahead and ask your guys' questions. Um, there's also going to be an email displayed, so if you guys have questions that you don't want to put your card up, feel free to email it, um, and we'll get that uh, brought up right away. Um, with that in mind, we have awesome panel host up here um, to ask some discussion questions our One Body team put together for our guest. We have the privilege to have two former NFL players as our guest today, Kenny Anatulu and Dave Tolerson. Kenny Onatulu is a former American football linebacker who played in the National Football League. He played for the Minnesota Vikings and Carolina Panthers. Dave Tolleson is a former American football defensive end. He was selected by the Green Bay Packers in the seventh round 2006 NFL draft, and he won two Super Bowls as a member of the New York Giants. With that in mind, please give a warm NCC welcome to Dave Tolleson and Kenny Onatulu. Um, before we go ahead and get started, we do want to present uh, Kenny and Dave some NCC gear. Yeah. Yeah. To get started, uh, we want to start. Uh, introducing the panel host with us up here. So we'll go ahead and start with.
So my name is Kenny Anatolu, but my real name is Alai Wala Kende Adebawale Anatolu. I'm a Nigerian, but I grew up here in Papillion, Nebraska. Um, lived here my whole life, played ball at uh, University of Nebraska at Omaha, and then went on to play a little professional ball. A uh, little background about me and kind of about my name. Anytime you hear a name Kenny or Kende, from a Nigerian person, you know they have an identical twin brother. So I have an identical twin brother. That's kind of the background of my name. And uh, I have three kids and a wife. I have two boys, five and a half and uh, three and a half, and then a newborn who's about eight weeks and a girl. So got a full house right now. Uh, what else? Uh, am I missing something, Dave? Uh, I don't think so. Your your daughter's beautiful. I appreciate That's it. That's gonna be your problem though. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't have a daughter, so I ain't gotta worry about it. <laughs> Three boys. <laughs> um, and we'll kind of get into uh, I think more specifically into our backgrounds and how we grew up. So I'll just give you a quick introduction, like he did. My name is David Tollefson. Um, grew up in Concord, California, which is just uh, east of Oakland. Um, played for Northwest Missouri State. I walked on there. That's where I met my wife. She's from Omaha here, went to Burke High School. Um, got married to her. I got three boys now. They're nine, six, and three. Um, my name, David, means the beloved king. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that's pretty, played eight years in the NFL, won two Super Bowls, uh, and, and I'm here and, and happy to answer any type of questions that you guys have today. Uh, yeah, man, it was always a dream of mine from a, a very young age. Actually, the, the I wasn't a 49er fan. It's kind of interesting as we talk about uh, this stuff we're going to talk about today. There was like a uh, socioeconomic divide in California, at least in the Bay Area. Basically, if you had money, you were a Niner fan, and if you didn't, you were a Raider fan. So I didn't have any money, uh, nor did my mom. And uh, as we get into it, I never met my dad. He left before before me and my twin sister I actually have a twin also. Tosh Lupo, he's actually the defensive coordinator at Alabama. We were sitting in his living room one day when he was playing at Cal Berkeley, and I was a carpenter. I was a carpenter for two years before I walked on. Carpenter, you're not even playing football. What do you think? Is, you think it's a sign-up sheet? So I call him all the time, like, dude, you missed the sign-up sheet, man. <laughs> but yeah, of course, I dreamed of it for a very long time. I would say with me, it was always a goal of mine. It wasn't, honestly, it wasn't a dream the way I, I thought about it. From about 10 years old, I started playing football, watching it. And I remember um, even when I got to college, I wrote down how many, uh, how many people were in the draft and I was gonna get drafted. And that was just a mindset I had from a very young age. So obviously at that time, I thought it was me that the, was the one who was doing it, but it was actually, you know, obviously God's favor on me that ended up um, getting that opportunity to play. I would say, I mean, as far as sacrifices, I'd say the physical sacrifice of being in athletics, uh, just from sacrificing your body and a lot of your time. I remember in you know high school and in college, those summers, you're in camp and you're running what we call gassers down and back, down and back, sweating while everyone's kind of enjoying your summer. So that's that's a big sacrifice when it comes to athletics. You just have to you really give up your time and often not, you know it. It has to be really worth it for you. It's a, it definitely has to be a passion because from the outside looking in, it looks, it seems crazy. Why would you put on what forty pounds worth of pads and run around and hit each other all day? But it's kind of what we did, and we we enjoyed it. So I would say that was uh, probably the biggest sacrifice for me that I personally experienced. And and I think uh, Kenny would agree to, you know, the word sacrifice. Um, I don't even know if it really describes uh, how we would think about what we were doing. It, I mean, it was a, we obviously, he had a goal and I had a goal that we wanted to play and we knew it was gonna take a ton of work and we enjoyed it. And uh, of course we, we missed a lot of things, you know, specifically in the NFL, you know, you don't get, you know, Christmases are tough and Thanksgivings are hard cause you're working and stuff. But 
Um, when you dedicate yourself to something, whether it's a sport or, or Jesus Christ or whatever, it, it's, you're really not, it, you're not missing out so much as gaining to get towards that goal. And, uh, you know, my mom wouldn't let me play when I was a kid. I had a beggar, and finally when I think I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, she got me to play, and I sucked. And I got whooped every day at practice, but I wasn't going to quit because I wanted to play football. Man, I think I cried every day. They coached a little different back then than they do now. Uh, I think, man, these guys at that time, maybe to our detriment even, and, and right. we might get into that, that we uh, devoted ourselves to it. I guess we just didn't know better. Yeah, I would say so. And, and you know, it gets a little dangerous when you worship something, you know, and when you have a false idol. And, and, you know, football, to some extent, I think we could both argue was a little bit of that, you know? So going back to what you said about that God was the one that was helping you to get to NFL. So what roles you think God had played in your life? I would say, I mean, just naturally, you know, you work hard, you work really hard, you get to a level like playing in the National Football League. You, you kind of think you've worked so hard and you kind of think it's your own doing, so you start patting yourself on the back like I'm just, we're, we're just that much better than everybody, but it's really not the case. You, you start looking back at your past and how the little things that God has done to put you in the place that you are. I mean, it's kind of an insult to people that some of the, the educators here that work really, really hard, like I work really, really hard, so I'm gonna be the best at something. Well, everyone works hard, so what is it? Why, why out of all those people, all those millions and millions of kids that wanna play professionally, why was it me and Dave? And you really leave it in God's hands. I mean, I know specifically, I played division two ball, so I didn't get an opportunity to get, I mean, Dave brags about this. He played D2 ball and still got drafted, but I didn't get drafted. I wasn't, supposedly I wasn't good enough yet. And I remember going to the Canadian Football League and having to prove myself there. And I still ended up being that small town, small school guy. And there were a bunch of guys that just got cut from the NFL and they were there in camp. And I was like 14th on the depth chart at one position. And I started thinking, man, how am I gonna, how am I gonna make this team? My dream's over for making it in the NFL, and somehow, some way, between some injuries and, and opportunities came, and I took full advantage of them. And I mean, literally, within a three-month period, I would go from playing in the Canadian Football League to playing for the Minnesota Vikings. And you just see how, you know, just how God's work in that and how out of obscurity I got an opportunity and I took advantage of it. So, you know, I can't. Me and Dave, we're not going to sit here and take any credit for playing in the National Football League because there are a ton of players that could play that had the ability, but it just wasn't in their cards. It's all God's doing. Yeah, 100%. I uh, went to junior college at a high school. A um, little background. I graduated high school with like a 1.3 GPA. Went to a, a, actually graduated from what was called a continuation high school um, where they had like smoke breaks and stuff like that. It was a little different. Um, uh, we do things a little different in California. Well, we do a lot of weird things different too, but, um, you know, I think it was crazy how it worked out. I played junior college and didn't have an offer. I was done playing football, got a job being a carpenter's apprentice. And, and, uh, one of my friends from junior college went out to Northwest Missouri state, which I had never heard of. And, uh, I got an opportunity to walk on there and little did I know at the time, um, it was, it was a public school, but the head coach, Mel Churchma, uh, it was very heavily faith-based in how he operated his, you know, the program day-to-day. -day. And being the oldest uh, son, specifically in a family, I have a little brother also, uh, he has a different dad, but uh, I had all this pressure on me to perform and make it to the NFL to provide this lifestyle, not just for me and my wife and my kids now, but for my mom and in my extended family, and, and uh, really, that's that's Mel Churchma. Really, where there was a meeting in his office after spring ball, going to my senior year, and I made it apparent to him I wanted to go to the NFL, and it was so important to me. And he looked me straight in the eye, and he's like, "Dave, you got so much other stuff you got to worry about than playing football in the NFL." And I left that meeting so upset, like, man, this old guy does has no idea what he's talking about. And uh, man, that just soaked in all summer, and I, you know, it was really a relief to know that, you know. Jesus was with me and kind of could bear this burden of, of this pressure. And, and 
it, you know, just in that specific instance is what really made me a better football player. Uh, I could release some of the demons that I had and, and uh, let him help help me with them. And, and uh, like Kenny said, man, every year they were trying to cut us. There were guys at camp that were better than us. And uh, I don't find it a coincidence that uh, we had the careers that we had and, and, and where we're at now in our life. Thanks for sharing a little bit about your personal backgrounds. Um, now we're going to transfer into like some heavier questions. And so the first one would be, there's obviously like, a lot of diversity, in cultural, ethnicity, like just differences. And so um, we want to ask if you guys have ever personally dis um, experienced discrimination and in what ways or if you've seen it on your teams. Um, want me to kick this one off? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's kind of an interesting, interesting question. Uh, for me personally, because obviously uh, being a white person in America, you know, <laughs> you don't really get discriminated against. Um, that's just the God's honest truth. But um, where I grew up, it was quite a bit different. I mean, we got groceries from church, powdered milk. I slept on a concrete floor. I mean, I, you know, I was uh, more or less uh, raised in what you would think uh, an African-American socioeconomic status was, you know, so I kind of had a different view on things, but there was one story that I, that I really wanted to, to share to stay that kind of shared today that kind of smacked me in the face. We were traveling to San Francisco from the East Bay and I had a couple buddies of mine that were from the LA area, uh, Compton and stuff like that. And we got pulled over and, uh, they all, the two guys in the back put their hands on the, one of them put his hands on the back of my seat and the same thing in the back passenger seat in the back right side. And the passenger, uh, I call him Brute, he, Wendell's his name, he put his hands on the, um, on the dash. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, man, it's the police. And I'm like, man, I probably said a cuss word. I try not to cuss anymore. But I'm like, man, don't worry about the police. And I remember after that minute, I'm like, dang. That's crazy, man. Just because these dudes are black, they feel this way. Like it was just kind of a, a punch in the head moment for me that really kind of uh, made me start thinking about things a little differently. And um, I mean, that, that that's a big reason of why I'm up here today because I feel like me personally, uh, how I grew up and where I grew up, I, I kind of have this I'm able to kind of straddle the fence a little bit on this whole racial reconciliation thing and uh, try to bridge the gap. I think one of the biggest things that I've had, I realized is, is I'm not black, I'll never be black specifically or Mexican or whatever. So I can't put myself in their shoes, but I can help, I can at least understand, you know, empathy is a word that I think gets lost in a lot of people. So that's my story. I would say with me, uh, I, I think I first experienced it through my father. My father was uh, came from Nigeria, came, went to Chicago where I was born. He went to college there. He ended up getting his master's right away, and he was still uh, driving a cab, couldn't get a job, working construction. Ended up moving to uh, Sioux City, Iowa, and ended up in Papillion, was a butcher for a while, and he ended up having a, he finally got his doctorate, and he changed his name from Adebowale to he, he made up a name, Stan. He wanted the most American name. And we, we had this conversation, and he doesn't look like a Stan. He looks <laughs> like me. But we had this conversation about him just saying, growing up as a black kid, you, you have to bat a 1,000. You can't make the mistakes that other people make because you're never going to be given the benefit of the doubt. And that resonated with me. And even going into college, I remember my senior year in high school when we are you know, getting all our stuff packed up. My dad told me this, if you ever got pulled over, if you ever get pulled over by the police, make sure you show them your college ID because they'll be more lenient. And those are just the type of different conversations that a uh, black American has with their parents as, as opposed to a white American. And that's the way, it's not a, you know, people use the word white privilege. And I think the white privilege isn't that you know, white people don't work as hard and don't struggle and aren't poor and don't battle things. It's just that black people don't get the benefit of the doubt when it comes to the justice system. And there's, there's just facts that state that. So that's how I, me and Dave, we've, you know, we've had our own experiences. I've had my own experiences when you grow up in a place like Papillion. And at the time, it wasn't very, it's more diverse now, but 
at the time it wasn't. And, you know, you have these, me and my brother, these two little African kids running around and, you know, we go to Target, we'd get followed around by the undercover security. And even in college, we, uh, we, uh, there was this establishment, we'll call it that for now, this establishment we were at in uh, college and the owner came up to us and said he doesn't like black people and he made us leave. And he told us that, and this was 2006. So it happens, you know, people are brought up in certain um, cultures and, you know, they learn things from their parents and that's just how it is. So that's how it's affected me personally. Um, what about on any like teams on any level that you guys played on? Was there ever any like racial reconciliation there? It, you know, football is really cool, man, because you, you get, I can speak specifically on football, and I'm sure a lot of other sports are like it. Um, it you're not really allowed to have a ton of problems because you're all trying to win a game. Um, you know, really being the minority in the NFL, it was never really like that. I mean, it, it was, um, there wasn't really racial tension. It's kind of the most politically incorrect place you can be. And it's actually really refreshing. Right. I mean, uh, at least for me personally, because it wasn't, it was just about who was the best at something. I mean, I was the only white guy. We had a guy named Chase Blackburn um, that was kind of on and off the team at the time, but I was really the only white dude that played on defense. But it wasn't even like that though. It wasn't, I mean, I don't, I didn't, it wasn't like I was pissed or something, you know? I, it is what it is and it was, uh, I, I, I can't, you know, even growing up, if there were any issues, uh, whether it be any uh, different ethnicity, um, it, it wasn't too bad. I, you know, I think Kenny has some stories that could maybe speak on it a little better, but it, we won two Super Bowls in New York, and that wasn't because we all hated each other. Right. I mean, we had, uh, we'd have a, a Bible study every Wednesday in New York, and we, there's only 62 guys, including the practice squad on an NFL football team, maybe 61, and we had like 40 guys in there. You know, so one of the, you know, you wanna talk about what we're doing today, you know, the strand that kind of runs through this whole thing is Jesus Christ, man. You know, he didn't, it had nothing to do with what you looked like or what you did for a job he loved you and he died for you because of that. And, and it, was, it was neat to kind of see that really propel us from a team that was nine and seven in 2011. We weren't very good during the regular season to a team that won the Super Bowl. And you guys probably saw it this year with the Philadelphia Eagles, which I thought was incredible because the big deal was right. These guys are making a stand for social injustices and they can't, you can't do that and win football games. Well, actually you can do it and you can win a Super Bowl too. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, I'll let Kenny kind of go on his end, but, it, it, you know, it's a little different when you're all trying to, you all have a common goal. Now I would say from my perspective, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that, that topic is very interesting for me because uh, specifically in the NFL, so people understand the dynamic of it, you have about 78% of the NFL is African-American, and then you have about 68% of those who are African-American are from the inner cities. So that's a, that's a big number. So you're talking about the inner city, uh, inner city culture. So it's kind of like, oh, this is the only opportunity we have. We have to go pro so we can take care of our family. So you have a huge dynamic of African-American players from the inner cities playing in the NFL. And what I experienced being from Papillion and growing up in this culture of a conservative culture and this type of um, just just area, I experienced. You can say what it is—a white culture. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm no you, PC. I, I, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. a white growing up in a white white culture and even the way I speak, I had a lot of issues with some of the African American players in the NFL. Almost like I had. It was almost like jail. Like you gotta you gotta go there and you gotta prove yourself, or they're gonna they're gonna try to walk all over you. So, you know, I mean, Dave knows me very well, so I had to take care of business on, on some occasions, but um, they actually, they, they didn't fully accept me. I had my wife's Caucasian, so uh, one, some of the players didn't like that. They, there's this culture from their aspect of, you know, you don't marry a white girl because, she, because she'll never understand you, so that, that's, from the other side, that's kind of the situation I got. And I was actually the one that got the, um, I was kind of the in-between guy and they got to meet my wife and meet their parents and 
it, it was just a different experience. So that's something I dealt with from the African-American side of things, having to prove myself and, uh, from that aspect. So I thought that was interesting, just, just a different perspective. Uh, before we go ahead and move on, we want to take some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, yeah, we have a question here. It says, uh, can you guys specifically talk about um, how your faith um, played out in like the locker room amongst your team members? And then within that, did you face any uh, pushback? Did you have any experiences where there's kind of pushback when you were um, expressing your faith? So, me and Kenny are our best friends. Let me give you guys some background on that. Yeah. We're the odd couple. Right. I mean, so <laughs> he'd show up at my house every day in the off season to work out at nine, I'd just be rolling out of bed and he'd get mad at me every, every day. Every day. Every day. I mean, it's so, it, it, you see this up here. It's, I showed up at his house 10 minutes early today just to make him mad. <laughs> and I, was, I wasn't there, yeah. so. <laughs> That's a first in about, what, seven years of working <laughs> yeah, out together? Is. But uh, as far as faith, we always had our Bible studies, and uh, I would always attend our Bible studies, but I, I'd get a lot of flack from some of the other guys that then go to Bible study because they'd, they'd call some of us game day Christians, meaning we only go to church on game days and, and stuff like that, just uh, almost like a genie bottle type of faith aspect of things. But uh, I was at Bible study every day or every uh, once a week, and then we would have ch a chapel service too. So that was really big for me. I mean, the NFL is a, it's an interesting place. You know, you get thrown a lot of money at a very young age, and a lot of people kind of coming towards you and trying to get close to you. So you really have to be strong from that perspective. As far as pushback, uh, never really got any pushback. I feel the Minnesota Vikings and the Carolina Panthers, they were open to that concept of uh, people in displaying their faith and you know being okay with the players having that, so. Yeah, we, we, we were the same way. I just shared that story with you guys, obviously. Uh, um, We'd have a prayer in the shower before every game. I actually got a T-shirt with Corey Webster. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He'd be yelling in the locker room, prayer in the shower, prayer in the shower. So I got this really weird-looking shirt with, like, a shower head and Corey Webster and him saying prayer in the shower. When I wear it, people are like, hey, what is You were that? dressed, though. I mean, you got to make sure. Yeah, he's know. dressed. I mean, yeah. yeah. All we were, hey, oh, hold on. <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah, where, yeah, it's that, just that, where you pray. That was a good disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, I should have said that first. We had, a, we had our uniforms on in the shower but um our our, our team our, our team we it was very faith-based in new york it was awesome it was super empowering i know personally i actually have some regrets on how i handled myself as a christian specifically like in the media that was always something i struggled with with jesus getting small and me trying to take maybe too much credit for who i was and what where i was at um and, and i think about that quite often um but it never any pushback um it was I mean, like we both said, the NFL locker room is a pretty interesting place, man. It's, uh, it's, it, it can be really, some really neat things can happen there. We had guys devote themselves to Christ. I mean, I don't know if anybody saw it on social media with the Philadelphia Eagles. They were baptizing people at the facility and stuff like that. So um, we didn't get any pushback. Got another question here. It says... Um are there any spiritual disciplines that Christians, regardless of race, could practice that would help foster unity within the church as a whole? Read the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that's one, obviously. And just, I mean, people should be able to, I know some of the guys I looked, I looked up to that were true Christians is what I like to call it. You could, you could see it in them just by their actions, the way they carried themselves, the way they treated their, their wives, the way they were around their kids, even the way they spoke, you know. I think naturally we can make excuses like, you know, me and Dave talk about like our language. Oh, it's the NFL locker room. You know, it's just what you do. It's, you know, it's a, it's a violent game. It's a violent league. So cursing and this, but you don't have to do, I mean, what's his name? Uh, Reggie White, one of the baddest, baddest, players on earth never said a cuss word and he would hip toss you throw you on the ground pick you up shake your hand and smile on your face so you can be you know as we like to say a dog you know as a compliment like he's a bad boy like this guy can really really play you can be a dog and and be a christian at the same time it's actually the biggest strength you know you can you don't have to be a lawrence taylor who did everything wrong but was nasty on the field you can be a reggie white do yeah. the right things and, you know, still carry yourself in the right way. 
Uh, we, we actually had a guy named Brian Keel. He played at BYU uh, who made a huge impact on me. Um, he was Mormon, so it was a little different, but it, it was incredible the way that he carried himself in NFL locker room, which, which obviously Kenny's just kind of talked about. It's, you kind of fall in that trap every once in a while of, of being one of the guys there. But um, I know now the relationship that I had with Brian, I called him a couple of years ago uh, after I retired. It was just like, man, I, I want to tell you how impressed I was with you. Um, he got, he wasn't married yet. He saved himself for his wife and it was always kind of like a goof around thing, but I'm like, man, that is, I think it's just incredible and a testament to him and his willpower and his faith in God. And, uh, so, you know, that was just one of the things that kind of was a lasting impact on how, just the simple things. Right. Yeah. You know, and I had mentioned the Bible, that's something that I've really challenged myself with. And, and, and Kenny has done a great job with me too. I just challenged me to dive into that thing. Cause um, I said it to Dr. Wood um, when we walked in here, but I'm pretty sure I know where Jesus would stand on all this stuff if he was walking around today. And uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, what a lot of conservatives think it would be. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, have really gotten into heresy with some of this stuff, man. Jesus is with the people, man. Um, he was trying to he was trying to get everybody to 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 do the right thing and believe in God and and so I think that's really kind of the thing that'll lead you in the right direction spiritually is is following his footsteps and this being the anniversary of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's death you know you you kind of look at the culture back then and how many people I mean he was basically martyred for what he believed in and he was right but back then all the followers of everyone else they in the Christ, so-called Christians, and I mean, they they killed them for it. So we have to we have to always keep that in perspective too. Something we was something I always say to people. Me and Kenny talk about it often. Was Jesus wasn't a punk either, man. Right. I mean, I I wouldn't mess with him. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you and know? you feel like like there's a weakness associated with being a Christian man, like. No, you know what's easy to do? And this is what me and Dave figured out. So what it's easy, so you, you play in the league, you make a lot of money, and yeah, it's easy to do what all the other guys do. That's the easiest thing to do, the Hollywood thing, that lifestyle. That's easy. You know what's hard to do? Not do any of that. Find the one woman you love, marry her, treat her right, raise your kids in the way that this should go. That, that's the Christian thing. That's harder than all that other stuff. And that's what me and Dave found out. Being a Christian is really, really hard, and there's... There's cr so much strength in that. I mean, it's powerful, even though there, I feel like there's a negative connotation associated with like being a Christian man, like there's weakness, but it's really not. It's more meekness, just given, uh, it's like a controlled stallion, not a out of controlled horse. Time for one more question. All right, this one's for Kenny. It says, uh, you talk about what kind of conversations are normal for black families with the parents of teaching their children. What kinds of conversations would be helpful for white families to have with their children to be aware of the situation and teach them to be leaders in the recon reconciliation? This, this is the biggest one for me and me and Dave. If, well, Dave doesn't know it yet, but we've been working on something he'll find out here shortly. He'll come in the mail, but <laughs> I, I, pop surprises on him, but uh, I think it starts at an early age, so my kids are mixed, so I started having conversations from an early age, because even my boys, we live in Elkhorn, Nebraska, so they don't see many people that look like me, so from an early age, I started reading to them about Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King and, you know, Derek Jeter and all these types of guys, influential people from sports and, and just from, from the political realm, and just educating them from an early age so that you don't come in a situation where they've never been around black people or brown people and they get the college and their only perception of people of color is from TV or from TV. And, and that's the, I think that's the biggest thing. Just tell, teach your kids from an early age, from a very young age, because my, my son was asking me, you know, why I was brown from an early age and I'm educating him. So I think Children pick it up right away, and it's something that we need to do. But most parents, we just kind of live in our own little world, in our own comfort zone, and we don't talk to them about other types of people. Do you guys have any more, uh, I guess, uh, feedback or anything you guys want to share with us uh, for the remainder of the time? 
Um, I think one thing that I kind of wanted to get across today was the admission that it's different for people of color than it is for white people as a white person is not, you're not labeling yourself, labeling yourself as a racist. You're just admitting that there's something wrong and it's not right. And I think a lot of the white culture has a problem with that. And, and, and me personally, I don't understand it just because how I was raised and how I understand what is happening. It doesn't, it doesn't identify me as someone that, that is bad. I'm saying it was wrong how it was done and how it's done today. And, and I need to do my part, whether it's little or big, whatever God has in store for me, whether it's sitting in front of you guys or a couple weeks ago in front of 30 athletes at Prue State, whatever he puts in front of me, I'm going to make sure that I do my part to, to make it different. My, my kids, you know, we have this long string text message that we're always talking, me, Michael Strahan, Justin Tuck, and OC, and Matthias Kiwanuka, and I had text them. I said, guys, uh, I don't know what it's like to be black, and I'll never know because I'm not. But just know I'm raising my kids to never treat anybody different. I know there's going to be three more, including myself, men on earth that, are, that believe that Jesus Christ died for them and was resurrected and that everybody's at the foot of the cross and it's even ground. So I'm going to have at least my four people. And I think it's important that we, as a white culture, work on our four people or three people, or whatever it is. And it could be 100 at some point. It could be just like we are here today. I don't know what's in store for any of us and who we'll talk to. But it's just getting, one of our big things that we say is get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's all right. I mean, it's not all right what's going on, but it's, it's all right to talk about it. It's all right. And I think me and Dr. Wood and, and, and Dave, we talked about uh, this uh, this quote that we hear passed around saying, I'm colorblind, as if that's a positive thing, and, and it's, it's not positive. We, we all know we're different. I think that's actually what makes America great, no pun intended, but uh, that is what makes America great because it's so diverse. America is a diverse place. It's, it's, you know, we accept our Chinese, we accept our Nigerians, our Latinos, everybody. We, we need to be accepting, and we need to, the one thing that, I, I've learned, and it took me to college to really understand the, the culture aspect of things was by taking a lot of black studies courses and just the education. I think if people are really educated on the subject matter, then the empathy comes into place. But a lot of people, you know, it, it's hard for them. What they don't know, they don't know. So, man, it, there's no more racism. I mean, we, we have a black president. We have this, we have that, and they think everything's okay, but they don't know that the... Call our culture, American culture is naturally, um, naturally racist in a sense, and it's naturally- It was built on racism. It was built on I mean, racism, gonna, right? and it's, I mean, and it's culturally biased, and it's just, it's until we acknowledge that, we can't make any change. So, education and empathy and, on my part. Can we give Kenny and Dave a round of applause, please? Aren't you guys so thankful for conversations like this? Um, yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it today. Um, I would just encourage you all to, man, keep having conversations like this throughout the week with the peers and the people around you. Because um, it's a hard conversation, and um, we don't know what we don't know, right? And we want to seek to understand and to hold each other up. And I just want, I just hope, uh, you know, that, man, no matter who you are or where you come from, um, whether, whether you're a small town uh, ministry student or whether um, you're a Hispanic athlete or you're, um, you're on the basketball team, you know that you're wanted here. And like, um, we just want to understand each other, amen? Yeah, because we have so much to offer each other. Um, so we're going to enter into a time of prayer. Um, would you guys just stand with me? And uh, go ahead and find some people that you normally wouldn't be around. Maybe, and circle up in groups about five or six, and we're just going to kind of walk through a time of prayer. You can go and spread out a little bit. Let me slide music in the background. And we'll circle up up here, guys, and we'll, we'll pray too. Um, yeah, absolutely. So good. 
<laughs> so for just a couple minutes, let's go ahead and just pray over our campus and just reconciliation and understanding um, as we continue to have these conversations. Go ahead and circle up, guys, and just kick it off and start praying. <laughs> 